this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Leanna Warner? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Leanna Warner was born on January 21, 1998, and lived in Chisholm, Minnesota. This is about three and a half hours north of Minneapolis. Her father is named Chris, and her mother, Kaylin. Chris worked in a mine and for an ambulance service. Both her parents had been married before and divorced. They both had other children from prior relationships. Chris and Kaylin met in late 1996 and became romantically involved. They moved to Chisholm in March 2003. By this point, only two children were living with them, five-year-old Leanna and 10-year-old Carly. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. We go to June 14, 2003. During the afternoon, Kaylin had taken her daughters out shopping. After this, they went swimming at a friend's house. When they returned home, Leanna wanted to visit one of her friends who lived just around the corner. Carly also wanted to visit one of her friends. Kaywin gave both her daughters permission to visit their friends, telling them to return by 5.30 p.m. Kaywin watched Leanna walk down the sidewalk toward the friend's house. This was at about 4.30 p.m. Carly returned by 5.30, but Leanna did not. Kaywin sent Carly to search for Leanna. Carly made her way to the house of the friend who Leanna was supposed to visit but noticed that nobody was home. Carly returned home and informed her mother about the discovery. Kaywin made her way to the friend's house and confirmed no one was there. She found Leanna's shoes outside the house. She called the friend's family to find out where they were. They informed Kaywin that they had been shopping in a nearby town. Given Leanna's personality, her mother wasn't too worried by this point. She thought that Leanna probably wandered off and would be found shortly. Kaylin, Carly, and a few neighbors searched for Leanna for two hours without success. Kaylin called Chris, who was working for the ambulance service at that time. He joined the search, but there was still no success. The Warners reported Leanna missing to the police at about 8.30 p.m. The police searched for Leanna by retracing her steps. They encountered two witnesses who spotted Leanna that evening. One witness was a man who lived in the house next door to the house that Leanna was supposed to be visiting. This witness had seen Leanna knocking on the front door of her friend's house. The second witness was a man who lived in the house directly across the street from the friend's house. He said that he watched Leanna leave the friend's house, cross the street, and approach a puppy that he had in his front yard. He was working on his truck at the time. He stopped to retrieve the puppy so it would not jump on Leanna. He walked to the backyard of his house to put the dog on a leash. When he returned to his front yard, Leanna was gone. The police and a rescue squad extensively searched the area trying to find Leanna. They found a child's footprint by a nearby lake. They searched the lake but did not find Leanna. They would later be informed that Leanna had played by the lake a few days earlier, which may explain the footprint. The police continued searching the area. Eventually, they searched a five-mile radius around Leanna's house. Investigators quickly ruled out Chris and Kaylin as being involved because their alibis were confirmed. A month after Leanna's disappearance, the police received a tip about a man named Bruce Christensen. The authorities described him as mentally unstable, and he had a criminal history, including burglary. As the police were searching for Bruce, he just happened to visit a bar that Chris and Kaylin were visiting. Chris asked Bruce to talk to the police. Bruce threatened to kill him and was arrested for making terroristic threats. The police questioned Bruce about Leanna. He told them that he was out of state when she went missing. The police confirmed his alibi. The police received another tip about a suspicious individual named Matthew Curtis. A man had seen some explicit images on a computer owned by Matthew which led to Matthew's arrest for a felony. Matthew was 24 years old and lived just two houses away from Leanna. He was described as a strange and creepy loner. 
Matthew was interviewed by the police about Leanna's disappearance. He said he had nothing to do with it, but he also mentioned how if he did kill her, they would never find her body. The police couldn't find any evidence connecting Matthew to the crime. On the day he was supposed to appear in court, his body was found in a gravel pit. He had brought an end to his own life using a plastic bag. In early October 2003, Chris and Kaylin appeared on the Montel Williams show. They were trying to bring more attention to Leanna's disappearance. The couple was ambushed by the producers of the show with a so-called psychic medium named Sylvia Brown. She was a notorious con artist who targeted the families of missing children. Sylvia informed the Warners that Leanna was dead. The man in his early 20s was the perpetrator. Sylvia claimed that she knew some of the digits on the killer's license plate. I'm going to guess that Sylvia narrowed down the letters as being from A to Z and the numbers as being from 0 to 9. On October 11, which was not long after the disappearance on the Montel Williams show, the Warners found themselves in a tough situation. They were at a local convenience store in Chisholm, Minnesota, having an argument. Kaylin was in her vehicle, and Chris was standing outside. She accelerated and almost ran him over. Kaylin was arrested and charged with criminal vehicular operation resulting in bodily harm. She accepted a plea bargain and was sentenced to two years of probation. In 2007, Bruce Christensen, who, as I mentioned, was investigated early in the case, contacted the police and said he was involved in the disappearance of Leanna Warner and he knew where her body was buried. When he contacted the police, he was in prison. Bruce had been sentenced to nine years for burglary. When he was serving that time, he murdered another inmate and was sentenced to 30 years. When an inmate gets sentenced to more time in prison, it reminds me of those signs that companies who employ mostly part-time workers put in their break rooms. The signs that read something to the effect of, you came here for a part-time job, why not stay for a career? Like these inmates get to prison and think, this is nice, I wonder if I could stay here for a long time. The answer is always yes. I think Bruce regretted his decision in becoming a career inmate. He lied about being involved in the Leanna Warner case in order to have one last chance to get out of prison before he spent the next several decades there. The police determined that he was not involved in Leanna's disappearance. At the time making this video, the Leanna Warner case remains unsolved. Now moving to my analysis. There are essentially only two possibilities in this case. An assailant kidnapped Leanna and probably murdered her at some point, or she walked off on her own and somehow died in an area where her body was concealed, like in a mine shaft, in a well, or someplace like that. The most likely explanation is the kidnapping and murder theory. Therefore, I will examine the theories in this case, which are consistent with that explanation. Theory number one, Leanna was taken by an individual who lured her away using toys and the promise of a new family. Chris and Kaylin describe some unusual behavior that Leanna was exhibiting in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, which appears to support this theory. Apparently, Leanna had come home with a number of Barbie dolls that the Warners had not purchased for her. Leanna told her parents that she received them from a little old lady. Other reports say that she received them from a friend. Leanna mentioned how she wanted to move in with her new family, although she never specified who these people were or where she was going. About a week before she disappeared, Leanna was preparing for bed when she grabbed her suitcase and once again said she was going to move in with her new family. Her parents dismissed the remarks as something that a five-year-old would say. The police investigated Leanna's behavior, but could not find any evidence that somebody tried to lure her away with toys. This theory seems unlikely for a number of reasons. Very few five-year-olds would want to run away or move in with a new family, and kidnappers usually don't inform their victims in advance about their intentions. Why would the perpetrator tell Leanna this whole story about a new family? They didn't need Leanna's cooperation to take her. If they gave her the toys, they clearly already had access to her. Theory number two is that Matthew Curtis murdered Leanna. Matthew allegedly had inappropriate and illegal images on his computer. He lived only two houses down from Leanna, and he was considered to be asocial and bizarre. He brought an end to his life on the day he was scheduled to be in court. 
which certainly looks suspicious. Matthew seems like a good suspect, but his pickup truck and residence were both searched very thoroughly. Nothing was found that could connect him to Leanna. The timing of Matthew's death indicates that he was concerned with the charge he was facing. He probably felt ashamed. Theory number three is that Leanna was kidnapped and murdered by someone unfamiliar with the area. Thousands of people were visiting the Chisholm, Minnesota area for a concert and a motorcycle run on the day that Leanna disappeared. Perhaps one of these people wandered into her neighborhood, just happened to see her, and decided to kidnap and murder her. This is an interesting theory, but when people are visiting another town for an event, they rarely take the opportunity to commit homicide. Most offenders would want to have some familiarity with the area before committing such a serious offense. They would typically develop a plan to escape that's based on their knowledge of the surroundings. Theory number four, Leanna Warner was attacked by someone not covered in another theory who lived in the community and had seen her before. There were people spotted in the area around the time Leanna disappeared who were never identified. Perhaps one of them or someone who was not seen was involved in the crime. The perpetrator didn't know Leanna would be walking in her neighborhood on a particular day. However, they were already predisposed to be a killer. They were just waiting for the right opportunity and they happened to find it on June 14, 2003. This theory explains how the perpetrator was able to kidnap Leanna without creating any type of disturbance. Maybe Leanna recognized the attacker. When considering the evidence in this case, how would I rank these theories? I think that theory number four is the most likely. The attacker lived in the area and had seen Leanna before. Then I would move to theory number three. Someone visiting from out of town was the assailant. Next, I would go with theory number two. Matthew Curtis was responsible. And finally, with theory number one, a person targeted Leanna by tempting her with the promise of a new family. Now moving to my final thoughts. Anytime a child goes missing is extremely stressful on the family. A lack of information can be frustrating, but unhelpful information, like misinformation, can be stressful as well. Here we see a case where the family was pulled in many different directions over the years. A self-proclaimed psychic made up stories about Leanna's fate. A convicted murderer claimed responsibility. But in the end, there was no accurate information collected in this case. There were no helpful leads. Just people trying to re-victimize parents who lost a daughter. Those are my thoughts on the case of Leanna Warner. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.